What is up, y'all? It's your boy, Aniki, coming at you with today's chapter review from My Hero Academia, chapter 323. For those of you who were here for the Church of MHA, you know we had much to discuss today, but now I'm bringing you my solo review. As you already know, we like to go page by page, so if you haven't read the chapter already, you might need to leave. If not, you can stay with me. So, interestingly enough, this chapter starts off with a cutback. Specifically, we cut back to uh, them negotiating again with how they came to terms with actually getting uh, permission to bring Deku here and how they got the mission to go beside him cleared. This is mostly to just help, help further explain that this isn't a decision that was the principal's or one that Deku made, but this is a decision that was made by specifically the students of Class A, which is worth noting as that's one of the main points that Ochako makes later. Now, Momo makes it a point to highlight that Shigaraki had already gotten into the school before using Decay. Now, it's important to note that we technically were not directly shown Shigaraki breaking into UA during the manga. During the anime, they did make it a point to let you know early on that it was, in fact, Shigaraki who decayed the UA barrier that day. So, as we mentioned last week, or maybe not necessarily last week, but earlier this week, that uh, the description of the UA being able to combine Shiketsu seemed in my eyes to indicate that the base would be able to move and must be operating like some kind of Zord or something like that. And we get told that the UA can travel, so I'm assuming that that isn't just about the plans that are explained here, but also in regards to the fact that uh, they have an underground system that is designed to send uh, people away. Now, the thing that's important about this is that I personally subscribe to the notion that Nezu was a traitor, and I think that part of the reason why his brain was so apt and quick to do these things and to make these preparations was so that they could uh, minimize the odds of them actually being able to escape, because any point of escape is also a potential point of infiltration, and with the fact that Nezu may very well be a sleeper candidate with his own programming, that's designed to make him think he's good and then turn around and betray the bad, like betray the good guys when it's convenient for the bad guys. When you look at the way that they've had access to UA for it seems at least 15 years, it, they need some kind of consistent opening and them having these subterranean bases could easily be something that it was built by or built with the same people who built Ujiko's labs. Therefore, meaning that there could already be a connection somewhere um, within that area. So that's just something to remember when factoring in all these underground locations. But the fact that it's a giant uh, robot and it can send things and people large distances is worth noting. Um, in addition to that, the building is segmented and plated so that it can break apart so that if they start seeing decay or signs of that, they don't have to worry about uh, the entire thing going down they can simply impart or let go of the piece of the base that's being damaged. So we get further explanation on because of the Kami uh, body swap that Toga pulled off but their interactions and them talking about how they needed to work together. This was talk, you know, we get the furthering of that plot line from Remedial Course Arc, but in addition to that, it's kind of explaining how provisional license still ties into this story and how the events with Kami ultimately allowed for uh, UA and the other sides of the heroes to take better precautions, hopefully in these upcoming battles. Now, Tokoyami asked an important question, which I in itself think was also suspicious. The upgrade seemed to, to be designed with the idea of decay transmitting in mind. And Nezu himself says it was simply intuition. And that is kind of a red flag to me. That's what part of like leads into that, what I consider that subconscious programming. Like he's kind of figured it out. And so then he's decided to figure out or try to account for all the ways things can go wrong. And if that's the case, he would already know about these potential things, or he would have known about Shigaraki when he was younger and just simply had these files saved away since he would likely, as smart as he is, they would want the super big brain character that he is to be able to access that full-blown intelligence when he was in his evil state or in the mode to uh, work with them, if that's the case. So that's kind of how I look at this, where 
this scripting has to be established. Well, obviously he could just be an innocent old rat dude and there's no issues, but that remains to be seen. It could just as easily be he did all of this because he was eventually promised Uchiko. And he could have a serious hatred for him as we've seen this split personality pop out. And more than likely, Ujiko would have been the one who experimented on him back in the day. Now, we get confirmation or we get information that says that Principal Nezu has had immense contributions to quirk morality education. More than likely, this is just another way of saying because of Nezu's high intelligence and ability to properly communicate, he's been able to stop them from conducting more heinous experiments on different animals and in general being less reckless with quirk medicine, likely leading, spearheading, and uh, helping develop multiple ethics commissions across the world, possibly explaining his deep pockets that were capable of funding this m blatant multi-million, arguably multi-hundred million dollar project in uh, dollar project in establishing this network under UA when he says that he's managed to pay out of this with his own pocket. Now, one of the things that Nezu talks about this chapter though is, and I'm actually going to read it because I want to make sure that it's understood. I don't want to undercut the speech at all, but what he says is a lack of understanding, intolerance. It seems we're always just one step away. Try as it might, humanity struggles to make true progress down its path. Issues shift and voices clash, making that single step feel like an impossible journey. In any case, I believe there's a sound argument to be made for him being here with us. Go on, tackle the matter with your full power. And it's important to note that Ochako is highlighted as this speech is ending, and we cut back to the present with people screaming about how Shigaraki's going to come for them, how he needs to leave, he shouldn't be at UA. We see Mitsuki and Inko actually together. We see that Kota and Ragdoll are actually in the shelter, whether Ragdoll is primarily focused on just being a civilian at this point or she's helping uh, with some of the safety and just day-to-day -day bureaucracy that we don't know yet, it has been established. But we see Monoma is with Aerie. Now this is, an, this is a cool interaction for me. I really like the idea of Monoma having been working with Aerie, helping her practice and train more. I think this is kind of the implication that we get here, because while he was referred to as the dark side of UA, his ability to analyze her quirk and help her understand that she has to stockpile things was undoubtedly something that would have helped her and uh, grow and develop while the training with her quirk. Furthermore, uh, by him actually being around her and making it a point to maintain his copy on her quirk, you can argue that he'd eventually be able to accrue and stockpile what resource that it is that she needs, and then that would help them further understand what the resource that Aries uh, quirk stockpiles actually is. So if we get a conversation about that in these next couple of chapters, don't be surprised, and it'll likely be something uh, in that network that leads to explaining how Aries quirks mechanics work. I'm hoping it's the feeling of regret, which I talked about in my video on Aries Rewind, but yeah, um, get about whether or not Shigaraki's after him, and they're trying to figure out what one for all and all for one are, and what are the mechanics of these quirks essentially establishing that not while hero society and heroes are struggling the media is instead choosing to chase that dollar and that we see that the media is going out of its way or making it a point to go ahead and utilize the drama for the clicks and the views even still when things are at their worst when people are being forced into shelters it very much seems like their goal is to kind of clickbait and generate views and still revenue kind of showing that the hero society treats like heroes and villains as me news pieces, media pieces, things that are for their entertainment. It's not supposed to have a true meaningful impact in their lives. Heroes and villains are just this thing that they watch on the news and then they go about their day. And if something bad is happening, heroes are supposed to handle it. They're supposed to save everyone, keep everyone safe, and they can never, ever fail. And that's kind of the issue that we've run into at this point, where all these people are fed up, but they're not thinking about the fact that ultimately the heroes are the ones who got their limbs broken and were stabbed and were fighting and watched their allies die next to them or failed to save someone. They're the ones who saw that on the front lines. And they're the ones who have to keep going out there day after day. But that doesn't mean that they're not human. And that's the big thing that's been lost here. And Best Genius shows up 
trying to utilize and it's important the, the reason why it's important that best genus is balked at here is because it's been emphasized that he has the highest popularity and approval rating of all the heroes so if best genus can't get a crowd to respond to him in a positive way then there's no hope for the average hero of getting this a positive feedback out of these people uh in fact, I would argue that that's part of why Hawks is off in the corner, basically, and the same thing that Endeavor's not even dressed up in his hero costume, but instead more over designed to just look like a detective, keeping them very low-key, mute, not noticeable, and Shoto just looks so upset. But they, while, they're, while Genus is fighting and arguing and just trying to get them to understand why Deku should be able to re relax there, not even as a person, but as a war asset that they should see him as the ultimate weapon and they should see him and prioritize his safety because that ultimately means prioritizing their own safety. That's kind of tragic, but that's one of the big issues that we've been talking about is that society, even whether they're adults, whether the, the hero is a child, they just see these heroes as commodities and children they don't care about the idea that children were forced into war. They care about the idea that this child might be more powerful than them and they want, they'd want they rather try to sacrifice this child and risk his life than to keep him safe and increase the odds of them winning because all they care about is the danger and whether or not he's viable as a weapon. And so as far as they're concerned, he can go and keep kicking butt out there until he's worn out and then go to sleep or something like that. He doesn't need to sleep here. And it, it so... That's where that comes from. And I also want to make it a point to just highlight that on page 11, one of the guy's heads looks particularly phallic, and that makes sense because he's kind of a dickhead for being this rude and aggressive towards the heroes during these situations. And Ochako springs into action. We see uh, Mike refer to her as gravity. We see Baku goes like taking a look on, looking on, and it kind of reminds me of back when somebody was, you know, Mineta and them were talking to him at the sports festival, and they asked how he could aim those explosions at such a fragile girl, and he's like, she's not fragile, that acknowledgement of her strength, and so we see Ochako move in, uh, Bakugo likely seems to have moved, and then she has taken the the microphone from present Mike, and she's finally talking, uh, doing the thing that we saw in the images that Horikoshi released and she kind of goes yeah okay he's got the special ability and he wants a break and then people are like yeah he wants a break we don't care he, he doesn't need to get he did rest and she's like no you don't get it he understood that you guys didn't want him here she's trying to get them to understand that he deserves the same empathy that he gave them because when he saw that he was fresh and he realized that he had a chance of presenting danger to them. He chose to keep them safe, distance himself, and go about and be vulnerable and be in as much danger as a person can be at during these times. And now she's asking them to look in the mirror and say, is it fair to have a 16 year old have to leave school and run around in the streets just to protect you when you can help too? And when he needs our help too, we helped him just like when they approached Nezu and they talked about whether or not the people would be okay and that they didn't even need to bring him back. That's something that's worth noting. The students didn't need to bring him back. They were fine just accompanying him and also being in the field with him. It's Nezu and the teachers who ultimately decide that they should bring him back, especially Nezu. And so that's what makes me feel like there's something afoot here. In fact, if you remember the at the beginning, the bubble next to Ida's face even says, which is why I said we should we would follow him, not bring him back. That was never the original goal. So that's worth noting too. Now, she kind of makes it a point to drive home that he wants to fix things. Midori is the one who's being hunted. He's the one under the most stress and he's under the one under the most pressure. He's the one stuck with the power of one for all. He's the one who has to go fight all for one and risk his life. He's the one that they're after going through all these terrible things. Meanwhile, you're just watching this little, this 16 year old go through these struggles. You're not enduring all these horrible things. You're not having to see the fights. You're not having to risk your life, get shot at and all these other things that Deku has actually been dealing with as a 16 year old. 
when he's supposed to be in hero school training, not active duty, front line. That's not what he's supposed to be right now. And so she's asking him to look at this smelly teenage boy in his tattered uniform with his broken gauntlets and his rugged cape and his boots that just have toes on them now. And really think about who he is. And the fox girl notices and realizes who he was because she was saved by him back before the, the, the stank. And she starts to pull up and I'm hoping that she gets to say something next chapter. And she says, special powers are one thing, but there's no such thing as a special person. And the idea is that all humans have the same needs. She's watched Nidai do this. She's watched Deku do this time and again. She's seen people at the front lines lose their last bit of hope and completely collapse into despair. That's why Ochako gets to see someone completely break into it. Got to see that. She watched that person fall into complete despair so that she'd understand just how human heroes are. She's the one who gets to make this point because her quirk has always been just grabbing something with her hands and getting to lighten the load. And now she's trying to lighten the load on the shoulders of heroes by explaining that they all have to carry some heavy stuff. And what Nezu says in the background is fascinating because it, it's like that single step feels like an impossible journey. And I believe someone takes that unlikely step and carves a path, the ultimate hero will rise up. One who surpasses even Yagi. Yes, even All Might himself. And I think that's a just an interesting train of thought for him. But I also think it's worth noting that the first step isn't one that Deku took. It's one that she's taking that will enable the path for him because the way forward isn't one person trying to carry everything. It's supposed to be people reaching out to each other, understanding what makes villains tick, and then going out of your way to make sure that those circumstances don't happen. So somebody like Twice doesn't end up into a life of crime and villainy if that one person hadn't gotten in front of his vehicle and injured. But even more importantly, even with that person getting injured, if people had accepted that that was just a simple vehicular accident, and not try to paint him as some kind of degenerate that was going out there willingly hurting people and just the scummiest of the lowest of the low and just treated him as a person who happened to hit somebody with a vehicle that ran out in the road. A lot of that could have been avoided. And getting them to reach out to the people like heroes who they see as just merely a service, like people that they more like while people seem to revere heroes in reality as a function they look down on them they look at them as a function that is supposed to do what they do to so that they can stay and go about their lives and yes that's what the role of a hero is trying to be but it doesn't change the fact that a hero is still a person and these civilians don't seem to fully recognize that and it's worth noting that some of the civilians we saw, the ones who called them losers, for example, were the same ones who were roasting Endeavor for losing towards High End, or having a hard fight against High End, I should say. And now they're back, still crapping on heroes, still unappreciative of the sacrifices and the danger that these people are in. And it's just a consistent thing, just like we saw earlier, twice his boss came back, also railing against the heroes. When if he had given him that job and let him keep it, we wouldn't have this issue now. But here we are. In all these small ways, people fail to reach out their hands and look out for each other or actually care about the people around them. And because of these steps they've taken, because of this lack of empathy and this blase mentality towards who is supposed to administer good in the world, because of this blase attitude about who was supposed to administer good in the world and actually help out, we have people completely opting into the bystander effect. These people see themselves as bystanders who, because they're not directly involved in the fight on crime, should never be impacted by it in any way. And that's just not how the world works, but it's how a lot of people feel that like all these other problems they should never have to worry about and they should never have had to worry about these people's gripes. And 
most of these people are fine with things going back to exactly how they were. But I bet you Fox Girl would like it if maybe mutants had a little less bad things said about them. Maybe they'd like to not be accused of being a villain as soon as they were seen. Small stuff like that. That has to be addressed because it comes from this complacency, this entitlement, this willingness to prioritize clicks and journalistic views and skewed journalism, making it seem, or at the very least, going out of your way to sensationalize and terrify people, all to make sure you get more advertising money, or coming down on the heroes and doing almost nothing to help, or overcorrecting, thinking you can do everything yourself and then getting in the way and causing more problems. There has to be communication. People have to be willing to work together, and they have to be willing to put aside their egos to achieve this. My Hero Academia originally started off and came across as like the start of Deku of Izuku Midoriya becoming like the number one hero. And while it is still very much that story, it also seems to be the establishment of the better society and how not only through Izuku Midoriya stepping up, but through this hero team forming and finally coming together and these people joining and taking on like the League of Villains, this highest tiers of criminals and coming together finally, that's how society is saved. And it seems to be more and more about the concept of like a formation of the Justice League and less of just about Deku becoming the greatest hero. It's about how being the greatest hero means working with other great heroes because the best leaders have a great team around them and they move forward and they work with other people. It is not just about them. So that's really kind of what I got away from this. Um, let me know what you guys' thoughts are on any of this, uh, how you feel about this chapter. I really enjoyed it. Hope you guys did too. I'm going to be back next week with the Church of MHA. You can go ahead and watch the live stream if you missed it for that live reaction, discussing just different ways how I felt in real time. And as always, you know, that's with multiple people. So you had Seiya, Ponsu, Tarnish, uh, Squid, Watkins, just the whole crew coming through. And I appreciate you guys always. Um, have a wonderful day. I'm Aniki, and I'm out.